Hey everybody, this is Chris with Overclockers Club. NVIDIA is releasing a new graphics card. Okay, so before we get it out of the box, let's look at the back of the box. We've got two sections here. Uh, the first one sort of calls out some of the features. We've got the NVIDIA Ampere architecture. We've got new streaming multiprocessors to improve efficiency and throughput. We've got ray chasing. Ah, ray tracing cores, not ray chasing cores. <laughs> We've got new tensor cores that uh, also help with the DLSS, and that DLSS is really cool. Uh, we've also got the game ready drivers, uh, the studio drivers, depending upon which way you use the card. Uh, the GeForce Experience, if you've never used it, uh, I use that all the time. I really like it. And then there's, of course, NVIDIA Shadow Play. And moving on to the next section here, uh, some of this is redundant, but we've got the second generation ray tracing cores, third generation tensor cores, PCIe Express Gen 4, that's always cool, Microsoft Direct X 12 Ultimate, uh, we've got eight gigabytes of GDDR6 graphics memory, of course the NVIDIA DLSS, I talk about that a little later, uh, G-Sync GPU Boost, uh, Vulkan RT, API, OpenGL 4.6, DisplayPort 1.4a, uh, supports 4K, 120Hz, HDR, 8K, 60Hz, and all that good stuff. And there it is in French, in case you speak French. All right, so now we can get it out of the box. And let's see, is there anything else in there? I think that's it. So here's a nice installation guide. Sort of walks you through the steps. Probably not a bad idea to uh, walk through here if you've never installed a video card. And of course there's the sticker telling you be very careful, wear the proper electrostatic safety equipment, which is what this is here. I uh, got all of the protective plastic peeled off of there. I figured you don't want to sit there and watch me do that, as exciting as it is. So it looks like we've got uh, three DisplayPort and one HDMI connection. There's a single four pin power connection of course two fans and those are your fan connections on the PC board I always leave these little protective covers on there until I'm ready to install it and I've got one here on the end at the top too which is nice uh, you can see the terminations for the heat pipes that snake their way through the heat sink And this particular card is overall about 200 millimeters. In case anyone has some tight spaces and you need to know, it's a, a double slot on the width, but it doesn't really overhang beyond that, which some cards do. So on the width, we've got about 35 millimeters, 37 millimeters, somewhere in that range on the width. So I'll get this installed on my test system and the card I'm taking off the test system is the 2070 Super from MSI and you know it's one of those things where you don't realize how large one card is and how small the other one is until you get the two right next to each other and you can see when you compare them like that when they're in the same relative position you can see there's quite a difference so um, let me get this installed so we'll take the protective cover off and let me go ahead and get the camera angled over to the test system this is the new Z690 carbon Wi-Fi from MSI this will be the test bed and we'll carefully get that push down in there all right a little stiff going in there but we got it 
All right, so let's see, we need an eight pin. Actually, gotta, gotta go that way. Make sure that's in there. All right, now, we got the display port cable plugged in and let's see what happens. Sometimes it takes it a moment for the drivers to all register, but it looks like I've got something coming up here on the screen. So there we go. And we'll get the drivers installed which looks like that is rolling right along there. I'll go ahead and allow access. All right. All right, so I got the driver updated, uh, the new latest Precision X1 from EVGA. So let's see how loud the fans are if we go full 100% speed. Okay, so you can certainly hear them spooling up. So there's the maximum speed. We're about 3200, a little over 3200 RPMs. You can certainly hear them. But at 100% I, <laughs> I would expect to. So let's drop these back down. So that sort of gives you an idea of the uh, sounds you get from the fans. All right, time to break the thermal camera out. We'll take a quick look. I've got it stressed with Ada 64. And you can see there's some heat back there behind the fans along the heat pipes and the fin stack. You can see there's some heat back there. Looking at the end here where our output connections are, you can see a little bit of heat there through the end plate. And then looking at the top of the card, again the fin stack where the exhaust is coming out, you can definitely see there's a little more heat there. And then looking at the back of the card, you can certainly see where the processor is. Right in there, there's a little bit of a warm spot, getting close to 50C, but not quite. And then over here, this is probably the voltage regulation circuitry on the other side of the board there, another warm spot on the back. But nothing here looks uh, concerning normal heat signatures that I would expect to see. Okay, so that thermal imaging is always cool. Uh, next here is the GPU-Z slide that shows the basic uh, information as to what's going on with the card. So you can look at your boost speeds, your memory speeds, uh, your default clocks, things like that. So it's always interesting to check that out. So next we're looking at the benchmarking here. This is using 3D Mark uh, to benchmark what this card can do. And you can see it sort of falls in the middle of the pack roughly. Uh, it's right in there along with the MSI card, the 3050 that I also reviewed, so the numbers are similar. So that was Time Spy. Now we move on to Fire Strike Ultra, and again we're seeing a similar, similar range where it fits in the mix, roughly the uh, middle of the pack. And then uh, same thing here with Time Spy Extreme, we're roughly in the middle of the pack. And then moving on here, here is the uh, Blender benchmark section. These are the raw numbers from Blender and then we move on into the actual charts that show uh, where it falls in the pack too. And again, lower is better. So the fewer seconds it takes to render, the better. And then we move into Classroom and then finally Victor. Again, you can see where it falls uh, not quite in the middle, but actually a little bit, a little bit toward the higher end. 
And then we move on to the ADA 64 benchmarks. These are the raw numbers. And uh, these are the floating point 32 gigaflops and floating point 64. Okay, so that was a quick look at the synthetic benchmarks. Now let's pop a few games in there and see what kind of benchmarks we get from those. Okay, so here is Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Uh, the benchmarks I ran, I'll put the requirements off to the side so we can sort of compare that. Uh, our resolution here, our screen setting is 2560 by 1080. And you can see here, these are your frame rates that are plotted out there. We can see the average. Uh, we got at least 39 and as much as 158, but our average there is 62. And we ran it again. All I changed here was the screen resolution 3440 by 1440. And I left all the settings cranked up to ultra high or as high as everything would go. And you can see we have a little more variation between the maximum and the minimum. Uh, the max is 144, minimum is 26. We're still averaging around 50. We've got some areas here where things might get a little, a little soupy, but uh, we have a, a greater variation, but still we're hitting an average of 50 with that screen resolution. So not bad. And I left the resolution here at 3440 by 1440 and uh, brought the settings down to high and I'm still getting 58 uh, frames per second average. And the swing here, there's quite a range, but uh, things didn't look bad. I can play it at that level. And now we have some Watchdogs resolution benchmarking here. Uh, let's see, we're showing minimum down to 16, average is 31. And that is with all of the settings cranked up to ultra. And I brought the resolution down to 2560 by 1080. And really this is really, really pushing it. So what I'll do now is bring some of the settings down and see if we can get the frame rate uh, up a little higher. Okay, so by simply changing the settings from ultra to very high, we have brought the frame rate way up here, the average, uh, closer to what I would call playable. Of course, our minimum here is still a little on the low side, but you can go in there and tweak some of the settings and really, really make some changes here. And again, we can see the whole uh, chart there of the frame rate. All right, we're doing some benchmarking here for Borderlands 3, one of my personal favorites. And I've got everything cranked up. Everything is at the ultra high settings. We're running at 3440 by 1440p and we're running 30, 32 frames per second, which is a little on the low end, but I like to start out high and then and then uh, crank it down as necessary. And the little benchmark report here shows our average is around 32. So I'm going to knock some of the visual effects down a little bit and see where we come in. And with dropping the settings down from ultra to high, uh, we gained a few frames per second on average, but not as many as I was uh, expecting. Okay, and just for giggles, I went ahead and brought the settings down to medium just to see and we're getting uh, much higher frame rates here on average. And the graphics to me look fine at medium. Uh, I could live with it. All right, so we got Fortnite cranked all the way up. I'm getting in the low to mid 30s, and actually upper 30s there. So I brought things down to a medium setting and they're not bad. Now, when I crank things up to ultra, but go into uh, 1920 by 1080p, now our frame rate jumps into the 60s to 70s. So that is quite a difference. And here's a quick overview of all of the games that I tested along with the settings and the frames per second. So overall, I, I like this card. It's really an entry level card. It's perfect for 1080p gaming. That's really what I would say the sweet spot is. Uh, it just really depends on what game you're playing and you're really gonna have to play with the settings and really find that trade-off between performance and uh, the aesthetics. Now keep in mind you get a lot of uh, cool NVIDIA 
features here. Uh, the main one that sticks out to me is the DLSS, which is your deep learning super sampling. It's a type of uh, uh, image, or, or I guess it's an upscaling where things are rendered at 1080p and then they're kicked up or upscaled to 4K. So you get uh, an amazing amount of detail with your uh, DLSS technology. Okay, so starting from the top here, you got your ray tracing cores, tensor cores, uh, PCIe Gen 4, uh, you're using DirectX 12, GDDR6 memory, eight gig of that. Uh, of course, you got G-Sync, GeForce Experience, GPU Boost. Uh, you've got all of these features here that come with an entry-level card like this. And I call it entry-level because this thing lists, believe it or not, for $249. That is amazing for a card that is really this powerful. Now, whether you can find one for that much, uh, that is hard to say at this point. Uh, until these things get out into the wild, it's hard to say what they'll actually sell for. But the list price is $249. And keep in mind that every manufacturer will have their own different versions and different flavors of uh, this particular 3050. And the pricing will, of course, vary according to the feature set and what sort of goodies that each manufacturer decides to offer on their version of the card. So given the feature set, functionality, compact size, quiet fans, and uh, a really good price, I would give this the Overclockers Club Gold Award. So... This is Chris with Overclockers Club. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.